So we nearing the end of a series by, uh, based on Andy's daily series, five things God uses to grow your faith. And as I've said every week, these five things are not in the Bible. You won't find them listed. But if you ask people of great faith about their journey with God, these five things come up over and over again. These are the five things that God uses to stretch and grow our faith. And God is always wanting to stretch and grow our faith. And so here they are. Firstly, practical, biblical teaching. We spoke about that. And then providential relationships. And then last week, uh, we dealt with that difficult word, uh, that dangerous word, uh, discipline. And we realized discipline is good because it always leads to progress. And ultimately, it leads to freedom. And then today, we're going to look at personal ministry. And then in two weeks' time, pivotal circumstances. Um, I would call that seven burning bush experiences. Um, it's those experiences that happen in our lives, good or bad, sometimes really ugly, where God comes in and is part of our lives as we lean on Him. In our darkest and sometimes most desperate times, our faith is stretched and grows. So, so don't, don't miss that week. That's on the 8th of December. But don't miss next week. A lot, a lot is happening next week, right? The Sunday school is going to be here. They're going to do their presentation. And that's always exciting and always fun. So don't miss that. And then we're doing the raffle draw after the service. And it's birthday tea. So there's a lot happening next week. So join us next week. It's going to be awesome. So why, why faith? Why, why is faith so important? I said it last week. What we all know. Those we are closest. Those we trust the most. We are closest to. Those we trust the most, we are closest to. We share with them more, we reveal more to them, our good, our bad, and ugly. Our deepest, closest relationships are those where we trust the most. And that is why trust is so important. And that is why the Bible is so amazing. And that is why we have to take it serious, because there is consistency. God always desired a close relationship. When we go right back to Eden, he required that close relationship that God designed for us because He created us in His image. And if you go right back to Genesis, ultimately what caused the breakdown between God and mankind was trust. Adam and Eve did not want that at some point they did what we all did do. At some point they did what we all do. We can't go, yes Lord, we know your way, we know that way, we know what you desire of us, but we think, we think if we go that way, we're going to miss out. We don't really trust you. We don't really feel like you have got our best interest at heart. And so, and so the trust breaks down. And where trust breaks down, the relationship breaks down. And it's really difficult to reestablish. And so the amazing thing is we look back at the, that if we look forward to the New Testament, our relationship with God is re-established, it's restored in the same way that it was fractured, because of trust. Because of trust. Our religion is not about a list of rules and regulations that we need to do to get in right standing with God. Our faith, our, our Christian walk, is, is about putting your trust in Christ Jesus. Coming to a point in your life where you decide, I'm trusting Jesus. I'm trusting the work of the cross for my right state with God. And at that point, something happens profoundly in our lives. We become a child of God. And our faith begins to grow as we learn to lean more and more and depend more and more and trust more and more on Him. Christianity is like any other, like, unlike any other faith. It's about a relationship, a personal Live with, talk with, walk with, relationship with God. The more we trust, the more we experience His presence. So like I said earlier, today we're going to look at the fourth thing that God uses to grow our faith, personal ministry. And if you talk to anyone that has a vibrant faith, a growing faith, they will tell you at some point along the way, God prompted them and nudged them to get involved in a way they felt ill-equipped to, unprepared to, and maybe even unworthy to. Ill-equipped to, unprepared for, and uneven 
worthy to get involved. In other words, they couldn't get that person out of their mind. That person kept coming back to their mind. Or they couldn't get that ministry need out of their mind. Whatever they did, that need kept coming back to them. Or they couldn't get that, that community challenge out of their mind. It kept coming back to them, no matter how hard they tried. Because they, they, they felt they didn't know enough Bible. They felt they didn't have enough time. They felt they, did, they weren't experienced enough. They didn't really know where to start. And there's tension there, right? Remember what we said last week? That's where muscle, muscle grows when we place it under tension. That's where it's stretched and challenged. That's where muscle grows. And there's tension there, right? There's the tension between the need that I see, the need that I feel, and my inadequacies, my lack, where I feel I fall short of being able to, 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 to meet this need. And there's tension there. And they would share if you ask them. And I stepped out of my comfort zone. Even though I felt out of my head, over my head, even though I felt out of my league, I stepped out of my comfort zone. And I saw God doing amazing things. Yes, practical needs were met. Yes, children were rescued. Yes, lives were touched. Something, but something bigger was happening. Something vital to relationship. My faith, my trust grew. God was doing something inside of me. I see it now. God asking me to step out of my comfort zone beyond my abilities and my skills and my talents. Beyond so that I can put my trust and faith in Him. God grew my faith. I was scared. And it actually made me pray. So we're going to look at a very well-known story. You all know it well. Um, uh, and, and it's about this miracle. And, and it's the only time, only miracle that is in all four of the Gospels, besides the resurrection. Um, and it's a well-known story. But in the middle of the story is a conversation that we sometimes miss. And, and, it, and there's a principle that we sometimes look over. But it's so profound. So the context. The context is... Uh, Herod had had enough. He was frustrated and irritated enough to the point that he had uh, John the Baptist's head chopped off, right? Why? Because John kept on talking and kept on preaching about Herod marrying his sister, right? Which was wrong on so many levels, all right? Um, and his sister, his stroke wife, right, was also upset. So ultimately, John died, right? And John was Jesus' cousin. And Jesus is upset naturally about that. Uh, he has anger and grief and all those emotions that we feel. And so he goes off to be by himself. But Jesus couldn't get away for long because the people followed him. And even in this tough time, even in this tough place where Jesus was going through a lot of stuff himself, he had compassion on those who came to him and he healed them. And so he spends most of the day ministering and healing people. And then we pick up the story in Matthew 14, 15. As evening approached, the disciples came to him and said, This is a remote place and it's already getting late. Send the crowd away because we are hungry and we are tired and we've been working all day and we need a rest. No, it doesn't say that, does it? No. But I think, well, I'm not sure, I don't, I'm not sure what the motivation was. Was it really that the other the, the people were hungry or, or were the disciples like, We are hungry, you know? Send the people away to get something to eat. Send the crowds away um, so they can get for themselves something to eat. So Jesus replied to them, they do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. Hello. They do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. He's basically saying, you feed them. Maybe you in that space right now, you see a need, it may be children in this neighborhood, it may be ladies that seem to be alone, it may be at your workplace or at your residence place, that you look around and you go, gee, I think these people need to know about the grace and the love and the message that God has for them. They need to know that our, 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 our sustenance, 
our satisfaction comes from God. But we then we stop and we look at ourselves. We look at our own abilities. We look at our own resources. We look at our own... And there's a tension between what God's asking us to do and what we have. And fear rises up in us because we feel inadequate. Fear rises up in us because we feel inadequate. Let's put this in the context. In the Gospel of John, in, in John's version, it's Jesus that initiates this conversation. He says to Philip, where are we going to get food? Where are we going to get food to feed all these people? In other words, God, God wants us. God gives us those thoughts, those promptings, those nudges. And then immediately we see the obstacle. In John 6 verse 7, Philip answered, Eight months of wages would not be enough bread for each person to get a bite. Not a meal, a bite. Eight months wages. Jesus, this is a stretch too far. We can't do it. We see the need, but we can't do it. Matthew 14, 17. We have only five loaves of bread and two fish, they answered. In other words, no Lord, which is an oxymoron, right? No Lord. We, we, we say no even to God. We can't do it. So they do what we all do, right? You do it, I do it. We make excuses, even to God. This goes right back to the beginning, to the first rescue. Remember Moses in the burning bush? And God comes to Moses and He says, I see the need, I see my people in slavery. I want to use you to go. And Moses says, no Lord, what if they don't, don't believe me? What, what, what am I going to say, you, who you are? And, and who am I? I can't speak. No Lord, I can't do this. And, and, and he uses excuses. Remember what God asked Moses? What's in your hand? Remember that? What's in your hand? What's in your hand? And he says, lay it down. In other words, surrender it to me. And it came alive. And then he took it up again and it was dead. And God did that in the Old Testament, and God did it in the New Testament, right? In Matthew 14, 18. Bring them here to me. In other words, the loaves and the fishes. Bring them here to me. Give me what's in your hands. He says it in the Old Testament in Moses. He says it to the disciples. And in 2019, He says it to you and me. Bring me what you have. <coughs> but I don't have a degree. I don't have enough education. I don't... Give me what you have. But I don't know enough scripture verses. I don't know, I don't know enough of the Bible. Bring, bring me the, the scripture verses that you do have. But I, don't, I, I want, maybe I want, have, I want have all the answers. Bring me the answers that you do have. But, but, but I don't have so much time. Just, just, just give me the time that you do have. And when that happens, guess what? All the excuses go away. In Matthew 14, 19. And he directed the people to sit down on the grass. Taking the five loaves and the two fishes and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke the loaves. Then he gave them to the disciples. And the disciples gave them to the people. And we just read that, right? We read it with faith. We read it because we know what's going to happen. We read it because we think the disciples had this amazing faith and they knew what was going to happen. But let's put ourselves in the disciples' shoes. Let's try and imagine the scene. Just there. Put it up on screen. Now go back one. Alright, just over there. You see over there where that comma is? Then he gave them to the disciples. You see where that comma is? I don't know, guys. Are you with me? <laughs> you see where that comma is? I, I think that comma, I mean. Unfortunately, the exams are finished in my household, praise the Lord, especially English. But you see where the comma is? I think there was a, a huge pause there, right? I don't think it was like a moment. Because if you read the other text, um, there's, no, there's no Jesus instructing them how to do this or what to do. It's actually just implied, right? But what, what happened at that comma over there? 
Alright, I picture it like this, right? I picture it like this. Alright, Jesus, yeah? Twelve disciples facing him. Behind him, alright? Not 5,000 people, 5,000 men, right? So, so it's like 10,000, 12,000, maybe even 25,000, alright? You can include the children, right? So, twelve disciples, Jesus, and Jesus breaks it up, and he starts on this end, and he starts giving it to them, right? And, and they're looking at it, and, 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 he, and he's moving down the line, and he's giving them all a little bit, and it must have been a minute amount, right? But just enough for a snack, alright? Like, like a little snack, right? Uh, and one mouthful. And, 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 and can you imagine when Jesus just gets out of air shot, ear, 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 ear shot? And these are some of them, what can we do? What, 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 what can we do? Should we eat this? What, what are we going to do? Are you guys with me? Yeah. And, and, they're like, and they're like looking at each other, what are we going to do with this? And, and, and then Jesus gets, and he's given everyone, and, and Jesus goes, you know? And they're like, are you guys with me? It's an amazing moment, right? Thomas is going, no Lord, I can't do this. And, and Jesus is just going, share. Share. Share what I've given you. Share what I've given you. And we know what happens. An amazing miracle. They all get fed and their 12 baskets over. Can you imagine the excitement? Can you imagine the amazement? Can you imagine? They all got doggy bags, right? And this miracle wasn't just about Jesus doing another miracle. He turned water into wine, he opened the eyes of the blind, and what he said, okay, what are we going to do next to you, Prince? No. This was faith lesson 101 for the disciples. Note he gave back to them exactly what they gave to him. He gave back to them exactly what they gave to him. And I'm sure none of them wanted to turn around. And I'm sure none of them wanted to go out there and give it. But they did. They did what they knew how to do. Trusting Jesus would do what only He could do. Let's say it together. They did what they knew how to do. Trusting Jesus would do what only He could do. And they didn't know what was at stake. It wasn't hungry people being fed, although that was great. No, it was their faith being stretched because there was that tension place. It's not enough. I don't have enough. I don't know enough. There's a need that is bigger than me, far bigger than me. But I feel God nudging me. I feel God speaking to me. I feel God saying I need to reach out to the mothers in the congregation. I need to start a group. It's bigger than me. And in that moment, my faith is stretched. And what is at stake is the size and the capacity of your faith. And faith and trust and dependence impacts our intimacy, our relationship. And the disciples don't go, wow, this is awesome. We're going to start a takeout business, right? <laughs> no, because they know it had nothing to do with them. All the glory went to God. And but their trust and their faith grew. So Jesus moves on to the next lesson for the disciples, faith lesson 201. They didn't know it yet. But in Matthew 4, 22 says immediately, and these two stories are linked. And, and Matthew, verse 22 says, he dismisses the crowd, right? Can you imagine trying to dismiss a crowd that you just healed everyone and fed everyone? Can you imagine trying to do that? And he sends the disciples ahead of him, and they're out on the sea, and a storm comes up, and the waves are big, and, and the wind's rushing against them, and they're in... They're rowing and rowing and rowing, and they're doing what they know how to do, right? But they're not getting anywhere. They, most of them were experienced fishermen, so they are actually doing now what they know how to do, but they're not getting anywhere. During the fourth watch of the night, 
Jesus went out to them walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and they cried out in fear. Wow. They scream like a bunch of girls, right? <laughs> this is St. Matthew, this is St. John, this is St. Peter, this is St. Um, Paul. No, not Paul, he wasn't there. But these are all, all, all the disciples, right? The ones of great faith that we admire and we look up to. But that's why the, that's why the Gospels are so authentic, right? <laughs> Would you write this if you were St. Matthew? And then we all cry out in fear. All of us. So I'm not just writing a mommy off. I'm just actually saying all of these acts were whips. I wonder if, I wonder if Matthew had a proof reading by the other disciples when he put, when he, before he sent this out. Verse 27. But Jesus immediately said to them, Take courage, it is I. Don't be afraid. Take courage, his eye, don't be afraid. And we don't know what Peter was thinking. But just maybe in that moment, Peter went, I know what's going on here. I can see what's going on here. We couldn't feed all those people. We couldn't feed all those people. But when Jesus asked us to, he met us there. Why else would Peter ask Jesus if I can come out of the boat? Verse 28. Lord, if you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. I wonder if Thomas is saying, you're crazy, man. What are you thinking going on the water? I wonder if John is thinking, Peter, if you want to get out the boat, get out the boat. Why are you asking Jesus? But Peter understood if God is prompting me, if God is nudging me, if God wants me to do it, then, as I do what I can do, God will meet me there. In the midst of the storm. They've been rowing for hours. <clears throat> Peter, I know this is ridiculous. Beyond my abilities, I can't walk on water, but if Jesus asks, if Jesus invites me beyond my abilities, beyond my skills, where I end, where it doesn't make sense, out of my comfort zone, if Jesus is asking, if God is prompting, I can trust Him. I know it's bigger than my capabilities, but I trust Him. In verse 29, come, He said. Then Peter got down out of the boat and walked on the water and came to towards Jesus. I want to state the obvious. There's a whole lot of tension there. There's a whole lot of stretching there. I can't, but he can. I can't, but he can. But I also can, so I will. Are you guys with me? What am I saying? Peter knew how to walk, right? Hello. Peter knew how to walk. Peter knew how to get out of the boat, right? Out of his comfort zone, beyond his abilities. When last did you pray to Peter pray? And some of you think, Dean, are you crazy? No, surely if we want our faith to grow, we've got to go beyond our abilities, our skill sets, our experience. We've got to stretch our faith muscles. When last have you prayed a prayer, please Lord, take me out of my comfort zone? Let me ask you this. Do you think Peter was at risk at any point? Jesus was there. The Peter experience is the Christian experience to a great degree. God is inviting us, inviting you, maybe to volunteer in the worship team, in the connect zone, 
in the Sunday school. Maybe it's talking to a friend or having an awkward conversation. Maybe it's standing up to a corporate injustice or offering support for mothers. Maybe it's extra classes for children. Maybe it's starting a new growth group for a particular age or stage in life. And there's tension there. I'm not good enough. I don't know enough. What if it goes wrong? What if they ask me that question? I'm not cool enough. I'm not young enough. I'm too old. And there's tension there. Your faith will grow. And with greater trust comes dependence. And with greater dependence comes intimacy. And freedom. In conclusion. Are you still with me? Let me ask you another question. And this is even a more difficult question. How many faith opportunities have you missed? How many faith opportunities have you missed? We see them as fearful moments. And yes, there is tension. But God is using them to stretch and grow us. When will you go on that camp that God's been prompting you about? When will you volunteer and serve in the way that God is prompting you to do? When will you take that phone call, make that phone call, have that conversation? Because God is wanting to stretch your faith. Throughout history, anybody that has done anything significant for God will tell you the same story. God nudged me. God prompted me. I couldn't get rid of that thing. It just kept coming back to me. But I felt inadequate. I felt I didn't know enough. I felt I didn't have enough experience. I didn't really know where to start. But when I took that step and when I walked that road, God came and God provided and God looked out and God gave me knowledge and God put me in contact with people and amazing things happened. Are you willing to say, as Peter said, and many others since Peter, are you willing to say, I'll do what I know how to do, trusting you, God, that you will do what only you can do? Let's say that together. I'll do what I know how to do, trusting you, God, that you will do what only you can do. That's the Christian law. Remember the bread and the fish? God gave back to them what they gave to Him. Remember Moses at the burning bush, what's in your hand? God just wants what you got. Don't make excuses. More is at stake than a need being met. It's your faith, your and my faith growing and our intimacy growing. I remember when I was 22 years old and I was became an elder in the church and they kind of didn't tell me everything that it was entailed and one of the things that entailed at that point was visiting people within the congregation and some of these people were a whole lot older than me. I was 22 and they had families and children and they were going through life stage things that I knew nothing about and I would sit in my car outside the house and I'd pray, Lord help! <laughs> because I didn't know what conversation was going to come up and, but it's amazing. Where you go, where you don't know, God stretches. And God grows us. He grows that vital thing that, that we all need. He grows our faith. Our dependence in Him. And we experience God in brand new ways. Are you willing to pray that Peter prayed? Lord, Ask me to come beyond myself. Will you be part of that process? Because it's in that that God stretches us and grows us. When we feel way out of our need, when we feel inadequate, when we lack the time, when we lack the experience, when we lack the knowledge, He meets us there. Let us pray. Yes, Lord, we thank you for this morning. We thank you, Lord, that it's your deep desire for intimacy with us, to have that close relationship, or for us to experience your very presence. 
But Lord, we know that that, that is based on trust. And we just pray, Lord, that, that you would give us the, the, the confidence and the, and the strength and, and just the pure determination to, to take those steps of faith that you're nudging us to take. Lord, even when we feel way out of our comfort zone, in over our head, Lord, that we would take those steps that you're asking us to take. Because we know it's in those moments that we experience you and that our faith grows. We give you all the glory and the praise. In Jesus' name. Amen.